Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. My name is Rupert Reed. I'm the chair of Greenhouse. Greenhouse is one of the three organisations behind uh, today's uh, uh, event. Uh, we've sort of put the boots on the ground with that part of it. Um, we're also a think tank, as you may be aware. Uh, do find out all about us if you don't know about us by going online. Uh, or by looking at our um, reports, some of which are over there and more of which were out where you came in. Do have a browse uh, through those, or by talking to any of us here from, uh, from Greenhouse. This event is also uh, backed by the Green European Foundation and the Green European Journal. It's a, a new collaboration. Uh, we're delighted that it's, uh, that it's happening. Um, and without further ado from me, except simply to say, if you haven't yet done so, please turn your mobile off, please turn your mobile phone off, um, I'm going to hand over for a moment to Benoit Le Chat, who is the chief editor of the Green European Journal, who's going to say a little bit about the journal, about the journal's involvement in today's event. Benoit. Okay, here I am. There, there you okay. are. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the invitation and for this project. Uh, and for us it's really important because it fits exactly with the project of the Green European Journal. Because our project is a European project and it's a green project. A European project, it means... We want to work at building a green European public space, and we want to do it transnationally. We, we just uh, don't want to meet only in Brussels. We also want to meet in the different <coughs> countries, in the different nation states. It's really important to give the opportunity to meet between groups. It's a green project because it promotes the ideas of democracy and of sustainability. And today our conviction is that we need to be innovative in discussing new visions, in networking all the people in Europe who are developing a new model of society for this century. Networking people, working, networking uh, people working on alternatives, that is exactly the purpose of this edition, the third edition of the Green European Journal, on this issue of uh, growth and degrowth. And going beyond the growth the growth dilemma is not an easy task. And uh, we have to admit that we will have more questions than answers today. It's a very crucial debate, not only for the Greens, for all the society. Huh? Uh, and we have to work hard on preparing the solutions on the political level, also on the economical level and on social level. And we are, start, we are having this discussion now at the moment where millions of Europeans are facing and ex are experiencing the concrete consequences of unsustainable growth. So really, uh, it's time to prepare the political answer that enables us to reach sustainability. That means to reduce dramatically our ecological footprint and to increase the well-being of all citizens. And the w best way to prepare this discussion and these policies is to discuss, it, is to discuss them with as many as actors as possible, not only in the traditional environmental sector, but also with the trade unions, for example, and all uh, new actors uh, who are emerging, for example, the transition movement. And this is exactly what we want modestly to support today in the, in the European Journal. Uh, it's an online journal with, with contributions from all around Europe. Some of the authors of this uh, third edition are here, and uh, uh, we will continue this discussion. I'm also very Happy to, uh, to, uh, to have Natalie Bennett on our editorial board because it's also a concrete network of people meeting to pr produce this journal and to exchange ideas. So we have already discussed the next editions for 2013. And uh, I would invite you to, to read this, this journal, to, to send us articles, uh, to react to the articles that are published online. Uh, uh, the next issue will be uh, dedicated to equality, equality <coughs> and sustainability. We will also have an edition on food and, and agriculture and on the necessary financial reform of our economy and on uh, green industrial policies. So thank you very much for your participation. Read the journal, promote it, support it, and send us articles. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you, Benoit. Okay, next up is my co-chair this afternoon, uh, who will, I'm sure, need no introduction, Jean Lambert, MEP. Uh, we're very grateful, among other things, for having this uh, splendid building to have this event in, and that's uh, a lot due to Jean. So thanks for that, Jean. And Jean is going to give us uh, a couple of words from her perspective. You'll be hearing from her again uh, later, but Jean. Okay, thank you. I wanted to welcome everybody, first of all, to Europe House. For those who don't know this building, there's a certain irony in that it used to be the headquarters of the British Conservative Party. Um, <laughs> and now proudly flies um, the 12 stars, the perfect number, outside. Um, so, and we have this space because, as a member of the European Parliament, we are entitled to use um, the facilities here, uh, you know, as part of, a, I suppose, our, well, our outreach, almost. So that's, that's how come um, we're here. The, for many of us as well, I think it was also mentioned that in terms of the issues around um, growth, that whole debate, it's one which, of course, for those of us coming from a green background, it, we're no stranger to that. It's part of the sort of founding critique of the, certainly the Green Party in the UK, the oldest of the national Green Parties in the European Union. We celebrate our 40th birthday, if celebrates the right word, um, next year. But... I think that some of the circumstances have changed, um, the, the sort of context in which we're, we're working from where, you know, we were looking at a critique in the 1970s. Not least, there are some of the specifics about technology. Um, <coughs> I'm interested in a no growth, degrowth, low growth, whatever sort of economy um, as to how we work, the satellite technology work for everybody, um, you, you know, mobile phones, etc. that we have with us. We're now also in the context, of course, where climate change is a reality, and we're also then having to work with that as another of the constraints, a real demonstration that we are moving beyond the planet's limits, and also within a shift going on within global power. That one of the things I do in the European Parliament is I chair the delegation um, for relationships with countries of South Asia, some of those countries most affected by climate change, but also some of the countries that you know, are people living in real abject poverty and who are looking for something better. So what are the arguments then that we give them about how don't develop as we've done, do it differently, do it smarter, but we're not actually prepared to give you the cash to help you do that. So there are a number of those sort of issues, I think, as well, which also make it um, a debate which is not only a national, not only a local debate, it's international. And I think it's really important that we actually remember that in terms of the context within which we're looking. And that that also brings with it its own particular challenges for some of the solutions that we might want to put forward. So that's all I want to say by way of introduction and additional depression. Um, but I expect this afternoon to provide us with a lot of really interesting, challenging thought, some good ideas and, you know, a real way of looking forward as because it's obvious that we shouldn't be coming out of this current economic crisis back to where we were before. We can't. We last one mentioned the Tory party earlier. I seem to remember a time when <coughs> Kenneth Clark was Chancellor of the Exchequer for those who are old enough to remember that. Um, and that was also a time of no growth in the economy. People weren't too happy with that. Certainly there are major parts of the European Union now where people are making, are finding their lives incredibly difficult. So it's also part of the issue about how do we make a society one where people's needs are met and where we are not seeing the poorest and the most vulnerable bearing the brunt of the changes which are going on. Another challenge. But we have an excellent panel. The answers will all be there. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. That sets the tone very helpfully, I think. And then finally, before we really uh, get going with our main thing this afternoon, which is the panel discussion on the topic, just a couple of words from Natalie Bennett, the leader of the Green Party, who, as was mentioned before, sits on the board of the Green European Journal. Thanks for coming, Natalie. I think it's uh, quite interesting and quite fun that the last time I was actually in Smith Square... I was giving a, uh, a speech where I had to bellow much louder. It was a uh, demonstration of solidarity of the November 14 strikes. So I was out the, out the front there bellowing into the microphone as one does in those things. So 
Today I feel like I'm giving my throat a rest. <laughs> but um, as Benoit was saying, uh, I've been on the uh, board of the European Green Journal for quite some time, uh, well before I became leader. And I confess that actually going to a board meeting was the first time I'd ever been to Brussels. And one of the things that really struck me, having been spent four years on the National Executive of the Green Party in England and Wales, is there's so much resources in the European Greens. They have these wonderful offices, they have staff. They're not <laughs> trying to fund things by digging down the bottom of the sofa and seeing if there's any coppers left. There's actually huge resources, huge potential. And it's something that I think the Green Party of England and Wales, we haven't always made use of those resources, particularly made use of those intellectual, international intellectual resources that are all there, all the thoughts, all of the work that's been done. And, you know, we're terribly lucky. English is the language that everything gets translated into. It's all there accessible to us. We've actually got to make use of it. And, of course, it works the other way. I was, I'm rather proud, although I can't read a word of it, that I wrote a piece for the European Green Journal on feminism which got translated into Polish. <laughs> the only time I've ever been translated into Polish. <laughs> Possibly maybe the only time I ever will be translated into Polish. But there's all those resources there. But here in the UK, we've got a lot of intellectual resources too. I was coming here today thinking about the transition town movement and how there's a little town in France I visit quite often and there's some people there who are trying to set up a different side of the community and when I started talking to them, they started saying, transition town. <laughs> and it took me a minute to work it out, but when I worked it out, it was like they've taken the idea of transition towns from Britain and it's being really spread. So what we've got here today is a chance to really exchange ideas bring ideas in from different currents, different ways of doing things. And this is something we've got to do much more of, because it's really very clear when I go out, whether it's knocking on the doorstep, <coughs> standing on a street stall, or just meeting people anywhere, people are really looking for new answers. Ordinary voters, people who have been sailing along through the past couple of decades, <coughs> quite possibly finding they're struggling a bit more every year, quite finding, recognising the weather's changing, things are different. But now they've really realised we can't keep going the way we are. We really have to do things differently. And what we've got to do is start here from the kind of addresses we're hearing today, the intellectual thoughts, and translate those into practical politics. We can go out there and say to people, we've got a different way of living, a better way of living, a better quality of life, and here's how we can deliver it for you. And I believe that's something we can do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Natalie. Okay, let me just take a moment or two to describe what's going to happen now in the remainder of the afternoon. We've got almost an hour and 40 minutes for the main business, as it were, which is the panel discussion. Our four panelists here, then a long time for, for you on the floor, then back to the panel for some short final comments, and then a response from, uh, from Jean to the debate and the discussion. Um, after that, we'll have a short break. Um, and then there's a much shorter item after that, just half an hour or so, where we'll have a presentation of the latest report in our Greenhouse Post-Growth Project, which is the big item of work we're doing this year, a whole series of reports about envisioning a Britain and a world where growth is not taking place anymore and where things are good, and trying to make that credible and um, comprehensible uh, to people. Brian will be presenting his report on the economics of that, and there'll be a response uh, to that. And then we'll segue from that into a reception where we've got all sorts of lovely things, including lots of um, organic fair trade wine, um, which we hope you'll all stay for. So that's what's going to happen this afternoon. Um, obviously, if you have to leave early, do, but uh, please stay around if you possibly can, but it'll be worth it. Um, I'm now going to move to our first panellist. We're going to go in a slightly different order to what we have on your uh, schedules. Molly is going to go first, uh, and then the order will be as it is on your schedule. So I'm pleased to introduce my colleague in Greenhouse, Professor Molly Scott Cato, author of several important books, including most lately The Bioregional Economy. Uh, she's now at Roehampton University. And uh, here she is, Molly. Thank you. So I'm going to start by saying something about science. On Monday, I got up listening to the Today programme, as ever, and I was listening to Evan Davis interviewing Fisheries Minister Richard Bennion. He was talking about his decision to oppose the latest EU fisheries proposal, which Bennion claimed he was doing on scientific grounds. Davies brought in the top fisheries scientist from DEFRA, who argued for the EU proposal. And the point I want to make is, is the interest I found in the fact that Evan Davis seemed genuinely perplexed by the ability of scientists to disagree. He was seeking a right answer that was scientifically proved and unassailable. 
Years ago, I put together a report called I Don't Know Much About Science, But I Know What I Like. It's Martin Amos's joke, but I've always enjoyed it. The reason I enjoy it is that it achieves with wit and brevity the task of challenging the right of science, usually in this context meaning statistical evidence, to trump other forms of thought. Caroline Lucas, couldn't have a meeting without mentioning her, Caroline Lucas has said that we're going to be the first species that is able to scientifically monitor our own extinction. Consecutive reports from the IPCC suggest that she's right about this, but I'm a bit more optimistic myself. And my optimism organises itself under my latest personal mantra, join the evolution. Now this is how join the evolution works. We, as the human species, are unique in being a self-conscious animal. When other animals receive indications that they're reaching the limits of their evolutionary niche, they respond to these by finding a new niche, or by failing to reproduce, or otherwise by ensuring that their numbers decline. But as humans, we're much too clever for that. We can use our clever minds and our technology to keep pushing the boundary outwards, ignoring and filtering out the clear evidence that the ecological safety limits have been breached. So as a self-conscious animal, we need to evolve self-consciously. We need to find a way to get a collective grip on ourselves, to stop believing our own fantasies, to get back down to Earth. And that's what I mean by joining the evolution. And I would argue it's something like that, a desire to do something like that that's brought you here today. So I've got nothing against science, I've got to say that because I know what Brian's going to do in a minute. And I think being able to prove that resources are not limitless and have some idea of the scope of the problem we're facing is vitally important in convincing those trapped in the scientific mindset. But it's not going to save us. We need much more human solutions to do that. So the, the rest of what I'm going to say, I've been rather miserly, uh, the chair's been a bit miserly, I've got ten minutes, so I'm going to race through as much as I can before he shuts me up. So in the next section, I think a bit about how that might work, and then I think a little bit about political economy. Um, so the next bit's called, who do we think we are? My contention here is that our consumption behaviour has social rather than economic motivations. And this is an idea I develop in my book, and I draw on the work of the institutionalist economist Thorsten Veblen. So Veblen posited that consumption was not motivated by a desire to subsist, but rather as a means of establishing social status. So here's a quotation. The end of acquisition and accumulation is conventionally held to be the consumption of the goods accumulated. But it is only when taken, in a sense, far <coughs> removed from its naive meaning that consumption of goods can be said to afford the incentive from which accumulation mm. invariably proceeds. Beblin's con conclusion was that the motive that lies at the root of ownership is emulation. So his notion of pecuniary emulation challenges the conventional economic account of a struggle for subsistence within an overarching framework of scarcity. In more marginal economies, subsistence clearly is still a motivation, but it's rapidly replaced as we, as we grow, in fact, by a desire to advertise our ability to consume and hence to establish our superiority. Veblen's conception of consumption as related to the establishment of status <coughs> rather than the meeting of need is actually a very important and a very encouraging insight because it suggests that our task in ensuring that patterns of consumption fit within planetary limits does not necessitate what often seems to be an impossible aim, that is, focusing directly on the objects of desire which, with which people surround themselves in our modern society. You know electronic gadgets, home furnishings, wonderful clothing, and so on. These things that people have come to regard as their birthright. But actually, our focus should be on shifting the basis on which social status is established. So carrying on the tradition of Veblen, Geoffrey Hodgson wrote in 2003, exploring the role of habit formation in the field of consumption behavior. He argued that the standard model of the utility maximizing agent that's central to economic theory actually omits the important element of our economic activity that arises from learned behavior and crucially can be changed through social action. So here's Jeffrey Hodgson now. Beliefs may change, not simply as a result of receiving information, but also because habitual mechanisms of interpretation may alter. In contrast to the pervasive idea of the given individual, 
the individual is formed and reconstituted in an ongoing process. Institutions matter in both cases. But in the habit-based conception, they can also lead eventually to new habits and new preferences or beliefs. So the emphasis on consumption taking place within the context of social institutions and being responsive to changes in the norms of those institutions, as well as in response to change in information, suggests an important role for cultural leadership, particularly from educators and politicians, in setting the parameters within which consumption can form part of a sustainable society. I just want to mention, sorry, Ray says I'm not speaking loud enough. This is a big, a big ask to speak <laughs> louder, Ray. This is a distinct cause from the behavior change that is now so fashionable, sort of nudge type politics. This actually requires genuine engagement and leadership rather than subtle attempts to manipulate behavior through incentives. I always talk about Stroud where I live, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time doing that now <clears throat> and talk a little bit about my home community, Stroud, and its inhabitants, the Stroudies. Because I think we're a community de actually demonstrating such leadership. What is a Stroudie, you might be asking? I think our first major achievement as a town of only 15,000 people is that we feature in encyclopedias at all. So one encyclopedia explains a Stroudie as follows. There is a stereotype of the Green Party supporting Stroudy, generally opposed to genetically modified produce, oil companies, and fast food chains. Stroud was one of the birthplaces of the organic food movement and was home to Britain's first organic cafe. We are a bit of a stereotype. Typical characteristics of the Stroudy are listed as including Reading Cider with Rosie by Laurie Lee, <coughs> walking up the steep Spillman's pitch with bags of shopping, regularly seen, Morris dancing around the Maypole whilst watching the sunrise on Painswick Beacon. Campaigning to bring back Stroud time, which is about nine minutes later than GMT. <laughs> Wearing handmade clothes and buying organic fair trade produce and doing some sort of art or creative expression. I would add to this the ability to demonstrate three different skills, at least, at least one of which is connected with music. So, you know, the reason I bring this up, aside from my local patriotism, is that we need something. It's very important that we find something to replace the consumption-based identities that dominate the lives of most citizens and are closely tied up with economic growth. And I believe that in Stroud we found something, and as some of the quotations I've read demonstrate, it's something that already demonstrates self-conscious responsibility for the planet. So the last little bit is called, why can't we stop? A very important question for us. So there are many myths that keep us on the growth and consumption treadmill, even though we know we're killing our planet and making ourselves and those we love unhappy. The most powerful is the newly globalized American dream. As the Occupy protesters said, they call it the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. <laughs> and it's really time we all woke up. In fact, I think a lot of people have woken up. For the first time, surveys are showing that the majority of Americans do not believe that things will be better for their children, and they mean better in material terms. They've lost faith in the American way of life to generate better. Of course, we didn't invent these myths to live by. They were invented self-consciously and with, I would argue, fairly socially benign intent by the advertising industry. A controversial point there. You might question uh, my suggestion that there was social motivation at the heart of the advertising industry, but I, I think there was, and that's something, again, that I argue in my book. Because the tendency amongst environmentalists is to critique the consumerist culture as though it was only designed to increase the profits of corporations. But I, I may, I'm not sure that's helpful in moving us on from the growth-based economy. And the, personally, I think it's more useful to understand how the horror of the 1930s, the last time capitalism experienced uh, a really serious crisis of economic demand actually forced genuinely well-meaning well people to find ways to overstimulate demand to avoid the economic crisis. So, w while Keynes is often credited with solving the problems of, of the 1930s, in fact, I would argue that there was a strong role for Freud as well. The Freudian concept I've got in mind is that of cathexis, Cathexis is defined as the concentration of mental energy on one particular person, idea, or object, especially to an unhealthy degree. I think this concept can support a critique of the way the consumerist culture focuses on selling objects, apparently to satisfy a certain need, when really they satisfy a deeper and perhaps even subliminal desire. 
Beautiful women draped over fast cars persuade young men that they will acquire sexual allure as well as a set of wheels. In this way, our desires and needs are themselves distorted, ultimately leading us towards lives of dissatisfaction and longing. It seems to me that excelling in this process was at the heart of what is widely called the genius of Steve Jobs. Here's a quotation. There were, there were some fantastic obituaries of Steve Jobs. And here's one from Julian Bergini in The Guardian. Jobs' success was built firmly on the idea that you should not give consumers what they want because they don't know what they want. No one thought that they wanted the first desktop, Mac, iPod, iPhone, or iPad before they existed. Jobs repeatedly created things that people came to want more than anything else, not by, else only by not trying to give them what they already wanted. And Rupert's telling me to shut up, but I also want to mention the way you've got to stroke all those objects. I resisted the iPad for a long time because I didn't want to have to stroke a piece of machinery. There seems to be something interesting but also unhealthy there. So I, I don't have time to answer the question of how to shift people's search for identity away from the gadget, but it seems to me a useful place to start to realise that the consumption identity developed to provide an infinite stimulus for economic demand can only lead to dissatisfaction. That is, in fact, the point of it. Its, pur its purpose is to, to make us dissatisfied so that we demand more, because if we were satisfied, we'd stop shopping. And, but what I can tell you, I can't answer that question, but what I can tell you from my personal experience is that in contrast to that kind of identity, the human scale, locally rooted, Stroudy identity is satisfying if only the economy would allow me adequate time to enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. I think that's a splendid, uh, mind-broadening way of launching us on this afternoon's topic. I particularly enjoyed the concept of individuals as reconstituted, which makes individuals sound like some kind of ghastly meat substitute or something, <laughs> which I think is really good because um, the counters the constant uh, propaganda in favour of individualism in our society. So thanks particularly for that. Um, Molly and I, as some of you will be aware and some of you won't, are both lead candidates for the Green Party for the European elections. We're trying to get to Brussels. Our next speaker is already in uh, Brussels. Aurelie is uh, there as a parliamentary assistant to Philippe Lambert, uh, MEP. She is also the former co-president of the European Green Party. It's a real uh, a pleasure and a privilege to have her uh, across the channel over here today. Aurelie. Yeah, thanks. Just... just clarify that I'm not a member of European <laughs> myself, and I was in Philippe, who used to be co-president. Who knows, maybe one day. I, I was told you were co-president. Oh, no. Ah. <laughs> but I, I follow that very closely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, thanks, thanks for inviting. So, uh, uh, the reason I'm here is because I contribute to the, to the edition of the, the journal, uh, Benoit mentioned earlier, uh, trying to put together some thought on, on this debate on... <coughs> growth and degrowth, and obviously in the 10 minutes we have each, we're not going to touch upon everything, I'm not going to touch upon everything, and I'm just going to try to limit myself to, uh, on one hand, a couple of arguments that I believe should be used more in the debate, that are non-ideological <coughs> argument, but more kind of fact-based arguments. Uh, and and uh, as a second step, I, I'll try just to give a hint on, on where should we go, what, what should we do, uh, which, which then should be the main, main focus of our, of our debate, probably later. Um, when I say non-ideological argument, um, it, it, there are many ways to, to, to discuss this question of growth. And, and one that we hear often is to say growth uh, is not <coughs> desirable and, and it doesn't bring, you to, uh, bring us the society we want. And, and this is true, and that's something I believe in. But... Um, hanging out in the European Parliament and in those kind of institutions, you realize that this kind of argument doesn't really touch people that are not already convinced. Um, so what I believe we should emphasize more as Greens is to focus on the fact that growth, one, doesn't deliver what it's supposed to deliver, uh, but second, that in the context of now, I mean, today, today's context, um, growth is not happening anymore, and this is not so much a question of the crisis. I mean, of course, crisis is making, is making it worse, but over the long term, we are in a period of low growth or zero no growth, and this is probably going to carry on for a long time. So those are arguments, I believe, should be put forward way more. Um, wh why do I believe that? Is that 
even if we are in an austerity type of period with loads of discourse around we don't have the choice, we need austerity, in, in the back of everyone's mind, in, in the public discourse, at least at Euro European level, but I'm sure also at, at the UK level, the, the kind of general mainstream, <laughs> mainstream argument is to say, well, okay, we have austerity now, but at the end of the day, we, we're going to go back to growth, and that, that's what we need to strive for. And why? Because growth gives us jobs, gives us wealth, gives us progress. And yeah, whether you like it or not, this is a very, very strong, strong belief that everyone has, uh, even some people among the Greens, and probably the majority of the Greens, if, if we look at the whole European landscape of Greens. Um, and, and this is a very, very strong myth that we have to, to destroy. Um, I don't have fancy charts or anything, but, but you can look up a bit in my article or on many other sources that, that, that are um, discussing growth, uh, the growth question. If you look at unemployment, just, just this specific um, topic, um, if you look at unemployment in Europe over the last 20 years, I have to look at my figures, uh, yeah, from the 1983 to, until 2011, you look at Eurostat figures for unemployment in Europe, and you see that unemployment has been between 7 and 10 percent all of all those, those 20 years. Okay, we have now 10 percent, which is linked to the crisis, but those 10 percent already happened 10 years ago. Of course, England is maybe a bit different, and you have a slightly lower unemployment rate, but this is at the cost of very bad jobs and very low-paid jobs, so that, that's kind of, we can put that together in the same bag, I'd say. Um, but you can look at many different indicators, and unemployment is the one I like to use, because this is really the thing you hear all the time. If we don't have, have growth, we, would, we won't have jobs. But actually, even when we have growth, this is not leading magically to, to jobs. This is not happening. Um, I mean, I'm not going to give you loads of figures, without, which I don't have specifically, but uh, you could look at <laughs> unemployment, at poverty levels, at well-being indicators. And all that has been proved by many, many sources that, okay, after, I mean, after a certain, up to a certain point, indeed, growth, which is economic material uh, wealth, does deliver on, on the basic uh, well-being for everyone. But in our developed countries, this is not the case. I mean, probably most of you know that, but this is really important to put forward more often. Um, the, the second point, on the second argument I think we should use, which is basically just observing the facts, um, is not so much that growth doesn't deliver, but it's even if it was delivering, growth is not happening anymore. And as I was saying earlier, this is not only about the crisis. Again, you, you, you can look on the internet, and, and I took data from the World Bank, uh, World Bank online database, and if you look at the evolution of um, European growth, but also world growth, but especially developed countries' growth, over the last 50 years, so from the 60s, you see the average of economic growth going down and down and down and down. In the 60s, you may have had, on average, around 5% growth, but then 70s, you go down to 34 and then 2%, and then over the, tw um, yeah, over the last 10, 10 years, you... We, we be, we've been stuck around 1, 1.5 percent. And again, there are, there are many reasons for that. And, and you shouldn't overuse scientific facts saying this is what has been happening, so we're not going to have growth anymore. But still, you have a sign that low growth is not a crisis situation, but it's more the result of the development of our economic um, model for the last 50 years. And even if you look at the forecast, and that's very funny, because if you look at the forecasts uh, that are done, for example, by the European Commission, you have a, a whole group in the, in the Economic and, and uh, Monetary I mean, Commission, in the European Commission, and they do this report on, on aging. Um, and it's funny, because if you look at the 2012 report, they forecast economic growth for the next decades, up to 2050, <laughs> at one, maybe 1.5%. 1 <coughs> That's on the one hand. But then on the other hand, you have the same European Commission just launching a launching big plan of recovery, relaunching growth, and, and basic, basing loads of, of policy programs on 3% growth. How does that match up? I mean, this is something you, you, you have to look at. And, and I believe as Greens, we should 
use that, that stuff more often, just showing the figures, saying, hey, look, this is not happening anymore, and this is not going to happen anymore. I'm not going to go into detail of why is that happening. Maybe next speakers will do it more, and I guess maybe Tim will touch upon that. But, but pretty much every part of our economic system as to do, as, is a part of the explanation of why we don't have growth anymore and why this kind of system, growth-based system, is not going to work anymore. Um, so you have, well, I'll just name them, but you have labor productivity you should look at, aging society, financialization of the economy, uh, the debt and the money, money based, I mean, debt, money based economy, all those kind of elements. I mean, you could do a thesis and thesis on that. I'm not going to go into details, but all those pieces have to be looked at and, and they will show that, that those, those pieces that used to be the engine of growth are, are not working anymore. And, and you, you can't just take them back and hoping to have the world as, as it was before. So that's a bit for the where, where we are and, and where I believe, as Greens, we should um, stress more more or, or, or arguments. Um, but then to try to be not too depressing, I, I, I'm just going to give a, well, a few ideas that are not new at all, but that maybe I'm going to try to, to um, um, well, explain from, from my context, from maybe the European context. Uh, three avenues that we need to carry on uh, building on. One, with one, in my point of view, one is, and the, the one and probably the first most important one, is the redistribution aspect. It's the social, ju social justice aspect. I mean, Jean mentioned it earlier, but this is totally essential. Why? It's just kind of math. If the pie is smaller and it's not going to grow anymore, well, you kind of have to divide it more to make it work. This is, this is kind of really common sense, but I believe as Greens, again, that has been one of our probably weakness over the last 10, 20 years or as long as the Greens have existed, is to kind of um, not put forward enough the fact that Green is social, essentially. I mean, the, the point is not to, to, to make the planet live on its own, it's to make us, all human beings, uh, live in the planet, on the planet, with the same resource for everyone. And so if you accept this idea that, that the pie is not going to grow anymore, then you really have to be serious about how we're going to divide it. And again, this can be, seems, yeah, common sense, but I believe as Greens, uh, this is not the discourse that, and in, in the action, polit political action as well, this is not something we emphasize enough. And even when we do it, still, uh, the, the in the public debate or in the, the media, whatever, we are still going to be seen as, oh, those greens, they just you know, talk about little birds and, and, and whatever, forests. And yeah, it's true that our, our environmental side is, is obviously very important, but we need to emphasize even stronger that we are, what we do is about people and it's about giving well-being for everyone. So redistribution, wealth, I mean, we can go then into more details about how to do that, but there are easy way, I mean, easy technically, politically, obviously that's another story, but, but redistribution should be at the heart of what we're doing. And I just want to emphasize that it's redistribution of wealth, but I believe uh, work and working time redistribution is also a very important part of the story. Uh, and probably we discuss about that later. So that was one, redistribution. The second part, the second big avenue we have to, to go deeper into is the investment one. I mean, investment that looks very mainstream, very common, we know about it. And it's true, there are part of stuff we have to do to, to I mean, in a non-growing economy or in a, in a sustainable, truly sustainable economy, yes, we will have to invest <coughs> in loads of different infrastructure, in, in education, in care, in all that. And that, that could seem kind of a, yeah, this is green growth, you say. I mean, just investing, this seems a bit green growth. But what I believe is essential there is to distinguish between investing in making our economy more efficient, and that's stuff that you see already happening and that you hear already in, in the European discourse or in, in the political discourse. So making our economy more efficient in terms of the energy we use, the resource we use. And this is obviously a big part of the story. And in there, th there is hope in a sense that this is something people understand, you know? Making stuff with less stuff, that's something that even only on pure economic terms, everyone understands, and you could push that 
forward. Um, and this is part of the story. But then, that's where the proper green vision comes, comes in. It's not only about efficiency. It's also about, also about finding the right scale for the economy. So even if you make less stuff, I mean, more stuff with less stuff, if you only, if, if you only focus on being more efficient, you, you can still have an economy growing and you can still well, end up with, with no resources left. So in the, I mean, that's a bit theoretical and it's nicer when you have a, a small drawing to show that, but, but you get the point. It's just that it's not only that you, you need to be more efficient within your economy, you also have to remind all the time that the economy is only a, a small part of the biosystem, <coughs> of, of the bigger yeah, ecosystem, and so that the size of this economy matters, and it matters a lot. And again, that's not new, that, that's what Schumacher was saying, when small is beautiful. But there you have to be a bit nuanced. When he said small is beautiful, it didn't mean you, you need to do everything only local and only, yeah, only small. It meant you need to find the right size for each activity, each economic activity, each social activity, actually. You need to think about at what scale do we do that? Is it local? Is it regional? Does it make more sense to do European, to do national? And that's something we Greens need to be very, I think, more specific about. Um, yeah, and I finish. Good timing. I finished on the third point, uh, which is where the, the biggest challenges are. I mean, already the first and the second, redistribution and investment, theory is easy, then political context is already quite difficult, and Jean could probably uh, uh, yeah, testimony about that. But then, maybe a, a big work that we still have to do, I mean, we and, and the others, is the whole changing the logic, changing the mindset kind of part. This is huge, this is big. Uh, and I just want to make three points, three very short points on that. One, I really believe as Greens that we have to complement uh, theoretical research with practical experiment. Uh, like Molly just, just said, specific example of towns, of transition towns, uh, all those kind of local stuff are essential because they can show that, okay, it works. And they are essential also for, po for politicians. When you are in politics, if you are able to say, look, it works, obviously that helps. And, for, and already for the people that are in those small systems, that's already good for well-being for all. So that's, that's essential. But we shouldn't only focus on that. As Greens, we are, we are, if we want things to change, we shouldn't just act at local level. Political, structural, systemic change is essential and is, is needed. And that's where the big fight is, and that's where the difficult fight is. Because it's all very well to do your, your local experience at your local level, but once you get in the parliament, what, once you get in the oh, House of Commons, you have one now, uh, that, that's, that's where you need to, to fight for political change. Um, and I really believe that that's a weakness that we should fight against. I mean, maybe not, I mean, I'm, I don't know much the Green Movement in England, but... Um, but in Europe or a bit everywhere, you see a lot of small uh, grassroots movement emerging, transition towns here, you have degrowth kind of movement in Europe, but you feel a bit this kind of anti-political feeling everywhere. And this is very dangerous for us because it's not, it's not about those people on the ground that are doing nice stuff and then those guys in political system just, uh, you know, having to compromise. The point is really to well, linking that together, and, and the fight against the rest is already uh, too difficult to, to, to divide between ourselves. So I really believe, yeah, complementarity will be the biggest challenge, knowing that maybe the biggest, biggest challenge is that we don't have all the answers, and hopefully we, we get more answers than we discuss now, but that's, yeah, that's for sure. It's true that we don't know exactly yet how we're going to finance social security if we don't have a growing economy. That, that's true, that's why I was mentioning theoretical research is needed as well, and hopefully Tim will update us on, on his last work that he's doing. Um, yeah, so how, how are we going to make this whole macroeconomic system function with, without growth? We don't know, that's, that's, that's an annoying reality, but we don't know. But at least if we keep together and we're trying to put together the pieces from the ground, from the theoretical, theoretical research and from political um, environment, hopefully we get somewhere.
Thanks so much, Aurelie. It's funny you should uh, ask that question. How are we going to um, finance uh, social security, etc., without uh, growth? That's one of the things that we're trying to do in the post-growth uh, uh, project of, of Greenhouse, where one of our basic ideas is that we are arguing that growth is no longer desirable in a country like ours, no longer necessary and no longer possible. Molly gave us a sense, I think, already of why growth might not any longer be desirable, and already very nicely there, thank you, started to give us a sense, I think, of both why it's no longer, no longer necessary and may no, no longer be possible. And I'd also just like to thank you very much for <coughs> stressing the point about the importance of redistribution and equality to this debate. It seems to me that one of the ways we can argue back effectively against growthist hegemony uh, in our society is by pointing out, especially to people on the left, that always going on about, well, we just need more growth, is the excuse for not talking about redistribution and equality. And that's the way I think it so often functions in our society. Um, so that's an important opening for us. Now on to our next speaker. Herman Ott is a Green member of the Bundestag, the most electorally successful Green Party in Europe, of course, in, in Germany. Thanks very much to him for um, taking the trouble to come all the way over here today. It's a real privilege to have him here. He's going to tell us about some of his latest work in this area. Well, oh, thanks. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, because it's London. I've got very fond memories since I studied here in the mid-80s. Uh, second, because it's a kind of a green family meeting. Third, because um, we need more European public discussions in space. And fourth, because of the issue, uh, the subject that we are talking about here because I do submit that it is the most crucial that we face as a species. How to organize our metabolism, our exchange with, with nature, with the earth. That is, I think, the question that we as a species have to solve in the next couple of decades. I would, contrary to what most people believe, I, I tend to keep my promises. Um, but uh, I have to track back now because I promised that I will tell about the, my, our work in the Commission, uh, the Parliamentary Commission on Growth, Prosperity and Quality of Life. But I've just realized while I was making a few points that I wanted to tell you that I will not have the time to do that within the 10 minutes allotted to me. So I will not tell you much about this Commission, but rather I'll tell you some of the insights that I, that we as Greens in the Parliamentary Commission got. If there is any questions afterwards, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, one thing about this commission, it's special because it consists of half parliamentarians and half experts. Um, there are certain limits to these experts. Most of them are male, white, over 50, and uh, academics in high academic positions. Uh, but nevertheless, it provides a, a good counterweight to us parliamentarians there. Um, one of the first, one of the insights that we got as Greens is growth, economic growth, is a fetish. A fetish. Um, it has been named already in a different context. And you cannot fight a fetish with an anti-fetish. I mean, it's, it's convenient. Well, you puncture uh, some doll with a needle, and then the other one punctures a doll with a needle. It works <laughs> quite well, and you can have a good argument about that. But does it solve any problems? No, it doesn't. And uh, our conclusion is actually, and that's why I find the title of this uh, conference so um, striking, is Beyond Growth or Degrowth. Because Growth is an indicator. Economic growth is a simple indicator. And it doesn't tell us anything about society as such. But it is loaded with a lot of meaning. Ultimately, it's happiness that's connected with growth. So if we talk about economic growth, we expect that we augment happiness in our population. Our conclusion is, if you enter into this debate whether growth, post-growth, non-growth, steady-state economy, um, decroissance or whatever, then you've lost. Because you're entering in a debate that you cannot win and that is not leading anywhere. 
And that's why we say we put the question of our GDP growth into the back. First of all, it's important to have political objectives and to reach those objectives and to take steps to reach those objectives. And it may be that the economy is shrinking, will be shrinking in the course of reaching those objectives. So what? This is one of the aspects that has to be taken into account, but it cannot be at the center. Second point, what I mean, I've been in this area of climate policy and energy policy for 15 years before I entered Parliament. But the term rebound didn't, didn't occur and appear to me very often. I, I used to work with the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy. And we've got wonderful projects and all kinds of advice that we have given on how to improve efficiency. You know Ernst von Weizsäcker's book with Emery Levins, uh, Factor 4. Half of the resource use, double the wealth. In this commission, and I'm very, very glad about that, <coughs> I learned about the devastating effects of this rebound or backfire. And one of my former students is actually just writing his doctoral thesis on rebound. And the first thing he did is he discovered 16 <coughs> different types of rebound effects, meaning that the efficiency gains by technological advances and innovations are eaten up, equalized, neutralized, and in some cases um, actually uh, more than 100% uh, neutralized by changed behavior of people. The most important, the, the most known, best known example is the car, where the average consumption of the car fleet has been the same, like between eight and nine liters per 100 kilometers, for the last 30 or 40 years, in spite of in extremely improved technology. Second will now be the light bulb. But there's examples of rebound which are, um, very, which are not as obvious. For example, if you isolate your house, you save 80% of energy. You save 80% of your financial resources. What do you do with the money? If you invite the whole family for the trip to Jamaica, <laughs> then the resource use and the emissions will be higher than if you had not um, redone your house. Our conclusion here is, if you don't look at it systematically and systemic ways, then you can improve efficiency as much as you want. <coughs> Factor 1000, Emory Lovins. And it will not do any difference. You will not get a decrease in resource consumption. And that is why we need the systemic approach. You need a, a society, society framework, cultural framework, where actually technological advances, which are necessary, can work. Which means you need prices that tell the economic truth. That's the ecological, social ecological text of financial reform. You need caps, absolute caps on resource use or on the um, emission of, of certain substances. Um, these are the ways of dealing with a problem. Our emissions trading, by the way, is an attempt at setting such a cap, but it's, done, it's, it's so badly done that it actually achieves the contrary. <coughs> but I won't go into details here. But if we don't look at it systematically, we won't get anywhere with our efficiency improvement. Third. It's not the resources, stupid. Um, we tend sometimes, and that was, of course, um, uh, initiated by Dennis Meadows, who we had in our commission, I invited him, um, to think that the resources themselves are limited, and in a way that might ultimately solve our problems, because if there's no longer stuff that we can burn, then we cannot pollute our atmosphere. But resources are not the limit. There's more in the ground than we think there is. It just takes a bit <coughs> more effort. It just takes a bit more money. It's more expensive. So the era of very cheap energy is over. That is true. But that will not solve us from setting limits. And that's exactly what we have to do. We have to set artificial limits, political limits, before we reach the limits of the resources. Because our atmosphere, for example, our oceans, 
These are the real limits to our activity. But they don't give a signal of scarcity. For an economist, that's the main thing. Right? If, if you have got resources and they become scarce, the prices rise, and you know, okay, you've got to look for something else. But these commons do not give a scarcity signal. Once they give it, it's too late. So we have to set it um, ourselves. Fourth, leadership is needed. There's some neoclassical thinking, and we are fighting with that in the Commission very hard, that everything has to be done on the global scale. It's, not, it's useless to do something nationally. It's useless to do it on the regional level. Because ultimately, if you don't use the resources now, I mean, you've, you, you're creating space for someone else on this planet to use the resources. We have to fight that because it's ultimately um, disabling us to do anything. So we need leadership. We need regions, cities, local communities, but also um, the European Union as a leader. And we need more um, research on that. My passing the, the buck to Tim Jackson here, um, who knows <laughs> quite well. Um, there's not enough economic research and economic thinking on the um, uh, benefits of leadership. Traditional economic thinking is a leader. Leadership is always disadvantages in economical terms. The only thing that disproves it is uh, empirical. But I mean, academics usually don't give a damn about empirical proof. Is it? Um, but we can show in Germany that we have created jobs, that we have a, stable, a more stable economy. Um, and we need more of that. Fifth, justice is key. We just heard from Aurélie. Um, and I think that's where ecologists, green movements, people who are more concerned with our fellow beings, in, in general terms, than with our fe fellow people, that's where we have to learn. It's inextricably linked with each other. First of all, theoretically, because we have to um, divide our wealth much better if we cannot grow anymore, but also in political terms. Because the biggest enemy of any socio-ecological transformation is not industry, is not the resource that we don't have. It's the perceived injustice of it. If it actually affects the poorer, not the, um, not the rich, if the, if the poor people believe that this is bad for them, it will not succeed. So it's a very, very important uh, political demand to connect <coughs> that all ecological measures have to be checked against their social collateral um, uh, it, it, impacts. Very important. Sick resilience. Dennis Meadows <laughs> says nowadays, uh, it's too late for sustainability. We need to build resilience. And I tend to agree that, I mean, I don't say it's too late, but I say that we have to build resilience. We've heard some examples from our previous speaker. In political terms, we need a two-track approach. We need one that emphasizes green economy, that emphasizes green jobs, that emphasizes win-win. We can save our planet and we can save the money in our pockets. That's important because that's what people understand. One thing, and that's for elections, and that's for gaining people's support, and that's for getting things going. But we also have to have a vision and we have to have a very clear analysis of what will be needed in the end. And we should not be fooled by our own positive images that we kind of tend to have. It will be much harder than most people think. And especially what I said about the rebound effect. I mean, if we cannot say anymore, um, efficiency will lead to, uh, to, 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 to take away pressure from your purse, 
Because we have to say, well, at the same time, the prices have to rise. Energy has to become more expensive. So it's at best neutral. We lose a very important argument. And we as Greens, and also ecologists, the ecological movement, also the ecological economics, have not really coped with that. And lastly, um, we need a new culture that has been alluded to before. Uh, and I think we need something, and I dare to say it, as a politician, uh, we need some new spiritual thinking. Um, because, ultimately, what will keep us as species, what will keep us from occupying the last space on this planet, squeezing the last resources out of the Earth's crust, if not something that we regard as holy or that we have to respect and that we cannot touch, nothing. If we don't have a feeling of something that is sacred and should be preserved and that we should not touch, we will do whatever is necessary to take the last resources out of our soil. And um, I myself uh, call myself an agnostic. I've left the Catholic Church long ago, but and, and that has been an eye-opener for me in the last years. That we have to find some um, something. Well, I cannot describe it. I'm not an expert in that, <laughs> but I, I just want to point it. Um, and you know Hans Jonas, um, and I reread his book, and ultimately, I mean, he tries to establish some kind of limit without having resort to religion. But it fails. But I think that is the task that we have to do. We have to develop some kind of spiritual um, thinking, feeling, that will prevent us as a species from squeezing out our planet. <laughs> Well, thanks, Herman, for, uh, thanks for a splendid and provocative uh, talk. Let me attempt a, a quick segue between that and a, a final panel talk here. Um, we in Greenhouse think that uh, a sine qua non in relation to this debate is a reduction of material throughput, including, as you stressed, crucially pollutants, to a one-planet level. Uh, the reason why we call, one of the reasons why we called our project the post-growth project is because we're deeply skeptical that that can be done uh, without uh, a steady state or degrowth. Uh, and one of the main reasons why we have that skepticism is because of the work of Tim Jackson. Uh, and so it's a great privilege to have Tim with us here today. Tim, as many of you will know, is the author of Prosperity Without Growth. He's one of the world's leading thinkers in this field. Um, it's an especially uh, a pleasure and a privilege to have him here because uh, he's just recovering from an operation and uh, it was touch and go whether he could make it. So thanks, Tim, for taking the trouble to be here. Pleasure. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> where, where should I start? I, I think I will pick up Herman's theme of the sacred because I think it's a very important one. And um, some work that I did a little before um, writing Prosperity Without Growth, actually for 10 years or so before writing Prosperity Without Growth, was looking exactly at what makes consumers tick. And I felt this was an important question because if we didn't understand ourselves, we are after all consumers, in that respect, then we had little chance of changing the system in which we're embedded. And so it, it was with a, a trace of, of, of um, enlightenment in a very secular sense and, and certainly interest that I came across a paper by um, a researcher called Russell Belk, which he was a consumer researcher and has spent most of his life um, looking at what makes consumers tick and why we buy stuff and what we do with it and, and how we relate it to our lives. And there's a lovely paper called Consumerism, um, it's called Theodicy on the Odyssey. And it describes his, actually his PhD research where he trekked across America just talking to people about their stuff, about consumption, about why they bought things. And what came out of it actually, in, in, for, for him, many things came out of it, but this particular paper dwelt on the, the sense of the sacred uh, that people pursue even through their consumption choices. And in some ways, particularly through their consumption choices in a world which has, in some sense, become 
increasingly secular. And so there is, there is an interesting theme there. And, and what it says, what it suggests is that consumers are not just consumers of stuff. They're not just materialists. They're not just after having things. They're not just acquisitive. They're not even status-seeking in Veblen's terms. They're not even habitual in, 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 in simple, um, unthinking terms. They are actually after enlightenment. They are, we are, at some part of our psyche, is actually after the good life, not just in a materialistic way, but actually in a sacred way, in the sense of pursuit of meaning, in the sense of pursuit of a, of a sense of purpose, in the sense of a pursuit of something higher than, in the sense of the pursuit of how on earth do I deal with the most difficult questions of all, like facing the mortality of parents, of children, of myself, or those that I love? How do I face the temerity of a God who created such a temporary existence, so laden with pain, which I must now attempt to grasp in my adult life and then explain to my children. And I, I like this idea um, that, that consumers uh, should not be demonized necessarily. I like the idea that, that we're people. I like the idea that as people we have higher vision. I like the idea that some of that vision is sacred. And I think it offers us not just a sense of being able to accommodate um, our own implication in a destructive environmental system, but also to transcend it, because transcendence actually is at the heart of this pursuit of the sacred. And it isn't ever the material stuff that mattered all that much to start with. It's the social belonging that it creates for us. It's the sense of identity that it brings to us. It's the sense of being in a society with a purpose that it transports and allows us to construct for ourselves. And those are things that we should hold on to. And they give us, I think, the most uh, forgiving vision of who we are as a species and where we should try to put our effort in terms of building a better society. And, and I think Herman's right to point to the sacred. At the same time, I think we should not always be forgiving. I... I I want to talk a little bit about austerity policy because it seems to me that it is profoundly wrong. Austerity is not um, the route towards growth. It's not the route towards prosperity. It, it, isn't, it isn't even the opposite of prosperity. It's, it's distinctly undermining prosperity for millions and millions of people across Europe. And I think the Green Party must take a stand in relation to austerity policy and speak the truth about what is happening. And the truth about what is happening is all about justice. It's all about distribution. Austerity policies systematically withdraw social investment, withdraw money from the poorest in society, withdraw from social security, withdraw from labor assurance, withdraw from health, withdraw from education. And they put that money in policies which are supposed to stimulate the economy at the highest end by rewarding the architects of a crisis that brought us all to our knees. And if you look at the policies that have been put forward, it's hardly rocket science. When you just try, follow the money, where does the money go from quantitative easing, for example? It goes into the pockets of those who bought corporate bonds in the financial sector in order to ease their liquidity in the financial sector with the hope that this will stimulate the economy back into growth. There are two things desperately wrong with that. The first is that these are not the people who need the money. And the second is that the policy is doomed to failure. And so I think there are points at which we as individuals and we as parties should stand up and speak the truth in relation to that, that austerity is a deeply inequitable policy which has no place in the pursuit of prosperity. I think if we are, if we are honest with ourselves, we have a couple of choices as people. We, we all know how difficult the territory is. We all know what a horrible dilemma it is. We all know that when economies stop growing and start collapsing, bad things happen. We all know that there are dynamics built into the way that economies are organized that leave us in this dreadful position. But I think we, we really we have two choices. One is, one is in the face of an economy which is at best not working and at worst horribly unjust. 
the first option is protest. It really is to get out on the streets with Occupy and the other movements and say this is deeply unjust. This is a place not just for evolution, but occasionally for revolution. And I'm talking, of course, of revolution in the sense that Gandhi himself might have conceived it in a peaceful, socially just, non-violent way. But it is nonetheless a form of protest that I think is absolutely valid as a position and one that we should think seriously about adopting. And the second, if we are through with or have any energy left after um, protest, is actually to be honest and start to construct the post-growth <coughs> economy. And that's the point um, that both Aurelie and Herman were, were, were sort of pushing me towards saying more about. And, I won't say too much about it, um, but it is remarkably simple, actually. I think after a couple of years, three years post-prosperity without growth, when I thought it was incredibly complicated, I've come to the conclusion that it's remarkably simple. The first thing we have to do is to ask ourselves a very simple question, what is the economy for? And it is really to provide ourselves with the capabilities to flourish as human beings. It's a communal task. We are the economy with the people working in it, with the people working in the public sector, in industry, in manufacturing, in education, in health, in social care. We are the same people who are working in that system. And we have, uh, I think, lost sight of that, partly, perhaps, because we've been thinking too much in terms of it all being out there. But the point, the point when you ask the point, what is the point of the economy, it is at least in part, of course, simple subsistence. But beyond subsistence, it is about social relationships. It's about psychological identity. It's about the sacred that I started with. And when you start asking what enterprise should be in such an economy, you find that beyond the ability to produce food and create housing, actually enterprise should be about the things that matter to our prosperity. So about health, education, leisure, recreation, renovation, refurbishment, culture the things that improve the quality of our lives, the things that the people in Stroud in their own particular way are already doing are the things, in fact, that the economy is for. And here we run into a problem because it turns out, as Aurelie pointed out to us, that in a kind of economy in which our material needs are broadly met and we pursue instead the idea of services, these things that entail people's time in order to deliver them, we run into an obstacle, which is that we can't chase labor productivity all the time. We can't ask teachers to teach ever bigger classes. We can't ask doctors to see more patients every hour, year on year on year. We can't ask the London Philharmonic to play Beethoven's Fifth Symphony faster and faster each year. <laughs> there are certain kinds of tasks in which the pursuit of labor productivity makes no sense. And the funny thing is, this sector where the pursuit of labor productivity makes no sense actually is a sector which is potentially materially light, which contributes to well-being, which works well at community level, which supports our economy, and which employs people. What could possibly wrong, be wrong with it? As it turns out, the only thing wrong, that's wrong with it, and the reason the economists don't like it at all, is because it slows down growth. And it slows down growth because you can't get labor productivity squeezed out of it increasingly year on year on year. But what does it matter? You've employed people. You're satisfying people. They're doing good jobs, better than they're doing in the supermarket economy, and you're delivering the goods that create our well-being in meaningful ways. I think it's, if you like, a neglected sector. I called it in Prosperity Without Growth the Cinderella economy. It is actually a very, very simple building block towards a post-growth economy that doesn't risk jobs, that does respect sustainability, that is socially just, and that has a chance of creating decent levels of employment. The two other ones, and I don't have time to talk about them, sadly, um, Aurelie's already mentioned investment. It is the most fundamental and the most important relationship in economics. It's the relationship between the present and the future. We need to reclaim for investment that sense of meaning and build investment architecture, investment institutions, and work with the investment sector to create funds which respect those principles. And very quickly, when you start looking at investment, you quickly run up against the problem of money. Um, and it turns out that um, the concept of money is another very, very simple uh, but very critical building block in the transition to a post-growth economy. 
Um, money plays a very distinct role in our economy. 97% of it approximately is created in the economy through um, the creation of credit by private banks at interest rate. And even governments actually have to borrow this money. So when you talk about raising the money for, financial, financial, for social security, when you talk about raising money for health, when you talk about raising money for education, when you talk about money, raising money for infrastructure, when you talk about money raising money for community, governments can only do this by, in the existing system, paying commercial interest rates to private banks to fund those activities. They have handed over sovereign power to corporate interest in the protection of social investment in the most vital areas of our lives. There are two tasks there again. One is protest, because this is deeply iniquitous, and the other is to construct a money-based system which is actually sovereign, which gives back sovereign power to national governments to invest in what matters. I um, was for some time very dubious about the possibility, the political feasibility of taking that message about money out. But actually very recently, in August this year, the IMF, bless their little cotton socks, <laughs> published a paper uh, talking about the Chicago plan, which is a plan that dates back to the 1930s and was the brainchild of an economist called Irving Fisher, in which he re recommended exactly that, to create, recreate sovereign money as the basis for social investment. I recommend these three paths, service-based enterprise, investment that respects the future, money as a sovereign resource for social investment. And I think after that, the problem basically is fixed. Thank you very much. <laughs>50 new companies to the area, it's created about 1,000 jobs directly or indirectly, um, and it's drawn about 30,000 visitors a year. So just as an input, you want to have a look at that. It's one model. It's been, it's been emulated in other towns of Australia, like the Cat Lane model, um, but it's, it's one example of how it can be. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I'm Hugh Small. <clears throat> Recently, GDP has been flat, the employment has been, been rising. Uh, this seems to contradict the economic wisdom that GDP growth is necessary to, to sustain employment. Now, there's quite a big argument going on between the, the uh, different parts of the growthist community. They're sort of uh, backbiting each other a bit. Some people are accusing the Office of uh, National Statistics of not knowing how to measure GDP and that sort of thing. Um, is there a new economics uh, explanation for this that the Green Party could you to develop policies that would actually encourage this uh, trend towards employment without GDP growth, and also allow us to fight against very expensive policies that try to recreate growth? Perhaps Molly or Tim could think about that and come back on it. Yeah? Uh, Tim arrived at the last <coughs> moment at the final <coughs> fundamental point. My father was in arguing in the 1920s for what the people in the 1930s were arguing for, which the IMF has just proven. I produced in 1996 a copy of the essentials of that book that Irving <coughs> wrote. And this I regard as the absolutely fundamental point which we need to address towards, if we're ever to achieve sustainability, equality, fair shares. Other things we need are basic incomes and land tax and fair shares of the commons. But this, I think, is the absolute vital starting point. Thanks, Brian. Prashant. Prashant, um, 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 question. I mean, I mean, I just want a slightly different approach to thinking about this, is whether um, it's possible for, um, 
total consumption, at least at the individual household level, to be satiated. And I'm just wondering whether we've ever thought of it really bottom up what kind of consumption goods people need. So, for instance, we know that about 30% of household income is typically spent on food, about four or five minutes on energy. And you know, for certain households, uh, uh, there's almost a transition going on as people become wealthier, more and more the households in that privileged position of being able to attain that. I'm um, just wondering whether it was ever thought of in the post four years how much the actual expansion in, in GDP has been actually to do with very, very kind of specific features, for instance, um, the growth and accumulation of cars in the economy, and therefore the whole scope of <coughs> GDP, which is really that accumulation of that of the car stock. Another might be um, the, the formalization of teaching and looking after old people, where previously that was part of the informal economy, which is part of the formal economy. That's one question, really, whether we can actually have a, a bottom up approach to measuring why there's been GDP growth, because I find that the odd of it. Um, the second thing is really, um, you know, we're used to that, the idea of the accounting identity where um, the amount of the GDP as measured through employment is equal to that measured through spending uh, on goods and, 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 and from the difference between purchases and, <coughs> and, and, and its measured in, inputs. But there's no particular reason why that should actually end up in a kind of desirable outcome. You could, you could be in a position where um, there's actually, because of labour productivity, there's actually too few jobs created through this kind of identity. And, and, but, even, even then, the kind of total demand is satiated. And I think it's really Tim's point again, really. I think I'm you Thank you. And maybe if one of our panelists could think about coming back on that. Um, over there, Jonathan, is it? Yeah. Um, just two, two comments, Jonathan, six from Greenhouse. One on Herman Ott's point. Um, I think you said that um, the problem perceived with injustice that the poor might think it's bad for them and that you might not succeed. I wonder if there's also a problem that. Um, the rich people, if they believe it's bad for them, it might not succeed. Um, and how that links to the, the issue of protesters when Jackson brought up. Um, just thinking of protests as a, as a group of environmentalists, a lot of the protests we've done historically aren't around consumption and the search for spirituality when we go to the supermarket. They're more about the building of the supermarket in the first place, all the roads, all the airports, or so forth. And I wondered if, if you might um, just comment on, on how we might address the source of, of which uh, at the point where we increase um, supply, uh, then it's easy um, for demand to go up. How do we uh, nip it in the bud, so to speak, um, at the start? Herman, do you want to come straight back on that? <laughs> yeah, oh, that's all the point about politics, is it? Um, that's why, in the first place, our growth economy is such a great success, because uh, the rising tide lifts all boats, and some faster, and the other ones not so fast, but... Um, that actually um, provides hope for everybody and um, saves us from making very difficult choices about the distribution of wealth and social justice. The second is, if uh, some measure is, um, is, is good for the poor, for the rich, of course, then it has the greatest chance of success. Um, I hold, however, um, that in this case, it is more important that we pursue a policy that, that serves the poor. I mean, for, despite, I mean in, in addition to all other reasons that there are social policy reasons, um, for um, strategic reasons, because, I mean, we've seen it in Germany, and you've probably had some discussions here too, uh, that even the far right, and in our case it's the liberals, the um, free Democratic Party um, that has never been really known for fighting for the cause of the poor, but they are now taking up the cause, saying, well, this is unjust. Uh, this is uh, uh, putting more burden on the poor than relatively than on the others. Uh, it's the uh, Institute for the German Economy, uh, a think tank financed by German business that has come up with a recent study saying that all this energy vendor, this energy uh, turnaround is unfair. And that's why I think um, if, if we lose that battle, then there will be no chance of getting uh, a real transformation in the energy sector forward. Um, but of course, I mean, um, this is not a, a, a recipe for kind of um, revolution of a social revolution that is turning the society upside down. Um, I, mean, I remember Susan George, I don't know whether you know Susan George, one of the grand old ladies, 
um, of uh, uh, criticizing globalization and capitalism. And uh, she delivered a speech um, a couple of years ago and said, my friends, um, you will not like what I say now, but I have to say it nevertheless. If we think that we have to pursue the social revolution before we attack the environmental problems, then it will be too late. Which means um, our envir the environmental change are putting pressure on us to act very, very fast. And uh, that's why we have to um, uh, uh, um, be pragmatic. And um, I would, at the moment, our system is redistribu redistributing from the bottom to the top. Emissions trading is taking, in Germany alone, money from the consumers and giving it to the companies in the order of 35 billion euros, all in all, without them doing anything. And that's the completely wrong approach. What we have to do is <coughs> taking it from those companies and giving it to the consumers. Thanks. Tim, would you like to respond to Prashant's question? Um, yeah, Prashant's and perhaps the first question that was raised. Um, Prashant, yes, I, I think there is a lot of, a lot of uh, interesting work in, in looking at GDP from the bottom up. In fact, we did something, Nick Marks and I did something 10 years or so ago, which was basically attempting to say where's, which bits of GDP are growing. And then there was also, um, and, and finding, finding interestingly that you could sort of say that material needs are met and the rest of it is non-material needs being met, and sometimes in very material ways. There's, there's structural complexities around that because, because you're, you're, driven, you're drawn, for example, through, I mean, a very simple example, through the shift from corner shops to, to supermarkets, you're drawn into transferring costs which were once in the economy into into people's spending patterns. So you now spend more time traveling to the shops than you did before, and this shows up in terms of, in terms of not just the, the, the money you're spending, but also the carbon you're spending into the environment. But it is a very interesting thing to do. Angela Druckmann um, from the University of Surrey has, has continued some of that work exploring sort of GDP from the bottom up, and has also recently published a paper called, what is it called, Angela? Um, missing carbon reductions. Yeah, the they're turning they're flights into... Flights Turning lights into flights was so the one I was thinking. Advert, yes. Exemplifies exactly what Herman was saying about the rebound effect. So it's, we have quite a lot of a lot of work on that, on that rebound effect. Um, and on the point about uh, uh, the point about the, the labour productivity, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, it, it sort of speaks to the first question as well. <laughs> that actually there is a route which talks about, and it was what I was suggesting with my remarks about teachers and doctors and the, and the London Philharmonic, is that there actually is a value into slowing down productivity growth. That value is recognized in economic terms, usually only during a recession. And it is a strategy that governments will engage in during a recession to put money into jobs, sometimes not very productive jobs in the economy, but to make sure that people are being employed in the economy. It is something that happens in a recession I think it is a much more powerful tool, in fact, for thinking about a post-growth economy because it creates jobs in sectors which are labor-intensive, which are, are productive of prosperity in very meaningful <coughs> ways, which can be material light because the value in the sector is, is, rests in human labor, not in material stuff. And so this, this strategy actually... Um, the, never mind the arguments about the statistics and whether the GDP has been counted right and whether the jobs have been counted right. It is a meaningful strategy, and to some extent, it already happens in a recession. Can I interrupt on that? Yeah. The governor of the Bank of England says he doesn't understand why it's happening. Can I have I a mean, Are you suggesting that the government is pursuing this policy but not telling anybody, or they're I, pretending? Uh, what they're doing, or? what they're doing, is that they are they're. They're doing well. The number of things that happen in, in a recession that naturally do that. So, for example, the productivity growth that you thought you could get by exporting goods into a, a foreign sector is no longer there. So, you shift your activities to things which are local, which are more people based. You want to protect your staff if you're the boss of a company to some extent. And so, you'll accept a productivity loss in a recession to create continuity in your staff. And then, some stimulus packages by government will actually be into sectors which don't have the same productivity growth. So there's a number of reasons why it might be happening, and it isn't unexpected in a recession. I think the one thing I want to say, the one thing I just want to add to that, 
and, and um, it is fascinating that this hasn't happened without a price, and the price at the moment is rising government debt. So you can't really get high employment unless you massage the figures and low growth, unless in the current system you're pushing up your, your government debt, and that has been the price of this particular squaring of the circle. Molly, you wanted to add to well, that? Well, I'll come back to that, but I was going to say something to our Austrian friend over there. Um, if you don't mind, to start with. Um, I'm writing a, an economics textbook at the moment because I just couldn't bear any of the ones that were available and um, I'm writing a pluralist textbook. So every chapter has a bit of theory in it and it was really striking how many of those useful bits of theory came out of Central Europe somewhere around the 1930s. So, I mean, there, there are many of your, your countrymen and related people there. Sorry, I'm struggling. Um, yeah, but I wanted to say another one, which is Leopold Kaur. Do you know his work? His work is very interesting, The Breakdown of Nations, it's called, and he, he actually make, draws attention to a, a local community in Austria, which is successful as a community rather than necessarily in, in energy terms. So, But I will certainly investigate that. Sounds interesting. Um, I wanted to say something rather simple in response to Hugh's question, which is um, I'm not entirely sure how the so-called value that was created in the city m featured in GDP measures but if you move from a situation where you were generating an awful lot of nominal value through selling financial services to each other to a situation where nobody wants to buy them anymore, I think you, know, you might see exactly the kind of so-called fall in productivity that's being demonstrated. <coughs> I don't think that would be particularly surprising to Mervyn King, though. So I'm but I think of... what you would be saying, then, that the, that, the, that the GDP that we saw before wasn't actual GDP, so our productivity... No, it was well, actual GDP, it was it's GDP. just that a lot of actual it GDP didn't is crap. It of real value, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. That, that's all. That's all. That's so, that, yeah. Let me mention to people who may not know, by the way, that Hugh has a, a recent gas on our website. We have these things called greenhouse gases, which are like sort of opinion pieces, uh, which is on this topic. So go, if you want to know more about what he has to say about this, do go on our website. Questions on this half of the room, please. Yes, there. Hi, everyone. Laurie, I'm not an expert on economics, but my understanding of the GDP and jobs point is it's partly related to reclassification of jobs, so people moving forward to full-time roles, to part-time roles, mm -hmm. and also people withdrawing from the labour market. So I think it's a bit to do with massaging the figures. Um, the panel's talked quite a lot about the hows of moving towards a, a green economy, and also some of the work. <coughs> I just wanted to make a point about, from a personal perspective, I, I think understanding the whys of how we've got to where we are is really crucially important and, and an important precursor to allow us to actually pursue the house. Um, two things I wanted to touch on. One is, one of the sort of crucial whys, I think, is uh, understanding by density that, that Molly touched on. So it seems like the, the ego has this irrepressible need to build personal identity and to feel <coughs> special, and a lot of that seems to happen through consumption. Um, I, I guess a question for, for Molly and, and Tim in particular is, do they think it's a step too far for people to move beyond identity? Um, a sort of Buddhist perspective of oneness, people understanding themselves as, as part of a, a whole, uh, not just with humanity, but with, with other life on earth. Um, another crucial sort of why I think is an understanding of human values, and there doesn't seem to be hardly any uh, public debate about this. So politicians talk about values generically. Uh, we've got these values, we've got those values. But there doesn't seem to be an applied public understanding of actually how values operate. So, for example, if you put a strong emphasis on power and status values, that suppresses your ability to feel <coughs> social and environmental concern to the point that you end up with arguably sociopathic governments, as we have in the UK, perhaps in Greece, Spain, across Europe, where they're acting in direct opposition to people's interests. Um, I feel like politicians need to have the courage to address these, these things head on and uh, not be afraid to create their own bold and radical frames. Um, talking about spiritual things, talking about uh, oneness, probably <coughs> seems quite kooky uh, on, on uh, you know, panels like Question Time. But I think the more you repeat these things and the more you talk about the root causes, the more it becomes the new norm. And that's, that's pretty much Thank you. Derek yeah. um, Osborne. Um, had some dealings with Tim on the Sustainable Development Commission in the early days of Prosperity <coughs> The point I wanted to raise is a, a disagreement I always had with Tim about the way we're describing the vision, which I dearly share, that we put forth today, where, where it's been characterized today as 
we've got to get, get away from growth, we've got to have possibly even degrowth. Um, and the vision that has been set out has been rather qualitative, hasn't been quantified. And it seems to me that there is a strong desire in society, amongst politicians, uh, amongst us as individuals, uh, for something to be measurably getting better. Measurably getting better. Uh, maybe it's happiness, maybe it's well-being. Uh, and there are efforts around that you have talked about this afternoon, and I wonder if you'd like to comment on them, to find something other than GDP, which we could measure, and would be a better reflection of what is we're all aiming at in this room this afternoon. The Rio conference, and the but it did <coughs> the United Nations off on the task of getting a better measure of what is going to be improving. But I think it will, if we can solve that one, it will be a really important thing for giving politicians and everybody else a handle so that they can demonstrate something getting better. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, David Flynn, Denfield Green Party. I've got two questions which relate to the context in which this discussion is going on. One is geographical. Um, it feels to me like a lot of this is based on the UK and the developed world. Um, what about the rest of the globe, which is very different? The second is historical, looking forward in a sense. Um, does this sort of analysis hold up in a world where catastrophic climate change seems actually much more likely than not? Can you say why it wouldn't hold up? Um, not, I think, briefly. Um, in the sense that catastrophic climate change will take resources out of the economy which are needed, which are either destroyed by climate change or which are needed to deal with the consequences of climate change. For instance, flooding requires rebuilding, redecorating. It adds to the economy, but it adds no value. Um, that is useful to human beings. They get their houses back. That's great, but it would be great if they hadn't lost them. Yeah, okay. Um, and let's have one more question before we take a few quick panel responses. Stephen. <laughs> Talking about climate change, uh, I'm told by people who know more about these things than I do that the uh, methane escaping from the permafrost uh, is now having a greater effect on the climate than the CO2 which we create through our activities. Now, if that is so, it seems to me it's going to be absolutely essential to find some way of getting these gases back out of the atmosphere. And I believe it is not impossible. Uh, at least there are, there are leads which one can follow. And is this something which we should be, well, if it's true, then we should be taking this up very urgently at a European level, and I wonder what the European Greens are doing about that. Okay, that's a great question, but I, I'm not going to encourage the panel to, to, to really try to answer it much, because I think that would take us a bit far afield. You're talking about geoengineering, really, there, right? I, I agree, but it, yeah. it does swamp everything else we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Herman, you wanted to come in on one of these uh, questions, and then other panelists can come in on others. Right. Uh, Derek Osborne. Nice to see you, actually. It's been a long time. Um, well, I thought that question would never come. Um, how to measure? And that's, of course, one of the things that we're dealing with in this commission. There's one working group on it, and uh, there's basically... Um, a general understanding that GDP or unemployment rate is, is not enough as, a, as an indicator of whether a society is going in the right direction or not. And there's basically three ways of how you can move on. One is the dashboard strategy. So you've got like 30, some, some 80 indicators. You've got lots of lights that are blinking uh, and show to the professional eye that something is going on or not, then you have got um, uh, uh, an integrated indicator, one indicator, um, integrating economic activities, social impacts, economic impacts, and so on. Uh, and a third one, which is um, putting three or four indicators next to the gross domestic product um, in order to kind of counterbalance. In, in the Commission, you, will, you find all three. Uh, the majority in the Commission, which means the Conservatives, as well as the Social Democrats, will move towards a dashboard, um, which we have already, a sustainable uh, uh, development strategy. Uh, and the problem is no one cares. I mean, there's lots of kind of indications for, any, for, for, for lots of things, but uh, no one has an overview, and uh, it doesn't arouse attention. 
And uh, what we do instead as, as Greens in this group is we would go for three additional indicators. One is GDP per person, per capita. The second one is an ecological indicator, the ecological footprint, developed by Mattis Wackernagel and others. Um, a third is an, a social indicator. So we take the 80-20 relation, which means the, the lower 20% uh, income of the, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a country and the upper 20%, what's the relation between them and how does it change? And a fourth one, and I find that uh, uh, interesting that I could uh, get my colleagues to also vote for it, is, an, is a subjective, a qualitative indicator, which means asking people, are you happy? Uh, lots of, there's lots of scientists who've got problems with that because they think, well, that can be manipulated. I don't think so. And I think it would be a I mean, as soon as you talk about a happiness indicator, people start responding. They find it interesting. And so it's a, very, it's a great way to actually uh, neutralize a little bit the gross domestic product uh, as, as an indicator of what's happening. Uh, what about developing countries? Um, Yes, of course. I mean, this is a, a discourse that is being held in developed countries because we experience the problems before others do. Uh, the whole idea of sustainability was developed in 19th century Germany because there was no forest anymore, basically. And so there had to be some change in policy. Um, but what, what I hold is that, of course, <coughs> as you can see in the climate um, debate, which I know for many years now, um, you, you must allow for some growth in, in, in the countries of the global south. There's no way to get around that. Um, but that means basically that the task on us as developed countries is bigger. So we have to actually reduce our uh, energy consumption, our CO2 emissions faster, or our resource use. Um, but we can also do it. And I think um, we and that's where justice comes into play. I think we need some kind of side payments. We need, I mean, we need to pay others to actually not do what we have done. And by the way, we are discussing this in a European context here, and Europe is a great example um, for kind of paying people to do what they should do or what they should not do. Uh, in agriculture, for, exa for example. So it is an idea that is around. And uh, in Germany, at least I know, our, our, our whole federal system is based on rich states paying direct money to poorer states to support them within Germany. And this has led to the uh, nice fact that in, in South Germany, which was predominantly agricultural after the war, um, that has helped them to become an industrial region, which are now in turn helping the rural area to um, to pay their bills. Thanks, so we speak. better we better move on. Um, no, we need to move on. So, Orly, okay. you want to come in on, on? We've got very limited time left. Orly, want uh, to come yeah, in on these I just, questions? I just want to pick up mm. also on the indicators because that, that's a topic I I worked on quite a bit, and I just wanted to uh, be a bit depressing here. Uh, just telling a few stories on what's happening at European level. Um, on the beyond GDP indicators, that's a very, I think, emblematic story of, of what's, what was the spirit around there. Um, so in 2008 or 9, I, I believe, the European Commission launched this kind of initiative called Beyond GDP to develop um, alternative indicator to GDP, so touching upon what, what Erman just said, ecological footprint, social dimension, all that. Um, one year after, so they did like this big conference, nice <coughs> website and stuff. One year after, the title was changed to GDP and beyond. Just already showing, I mean, this is a detail, but that's really what's happening all the time. Really showing, okay, we're going to talk about something else, but still we keep GDP. So beyond GDP, then GDP and beyond. So that was 2009. We did, in European Parliament, we did this report saying, yes, do it, you know, just go for it. <laughs> Um, and, and they did this kind of roadmap with no dates and no specific targets on it, but still a roadmap saying we're going to work on it. Now we are in 2012, and I haven't seen any, any report or anything there. And what Eurostat is saying us is that, well, and 
this is really unfortunate, but they say, well, we don't have enough resource to focus on that, and now with all the new austerity measure, we are, we are asked by other people in, in, in Europe to, to, you know, to research more and to have better data on, on government debt and on I mean, all austerity-related indicators. So I'm afraid this is really the state of play now. And, and, and I mean, unfortunately, I have many stories like that just to, to show how um, power relations in the institution, I mean, this is Europe, but that, that's, I believe, what was going on in, in many, at many, at many different levels. The, the power um, relation is definitely not in, in our favor. I mean, it's definitely uh, not looking good. I mean, if you look at the, the power of, of, this is something you hear all the time, but the power of banking and financial industry is really, really huge. Still, a few days ago, um, they are discussing negotiating the banking regulation, I mean, a piece of banking regulation, uh, and one of the topics on that is, is bankers' bonuses. I mean, this is, you know, very... Symbolic, but there, they are not yet. Um, they, they didn't reach a deal yet, and what's on the table now, and which is not accept, acceptable by banker industries and by member state, is that um, is to restrict b uh, bonuses. So it's the one-to-one -one rule. So if you have a salary of one, is to restrict your bonus to one. So i.e., if you have I don't know five hundred thousand uh, euro a year then your bonus could be only 500,000 euros. And this is not acceptable for many people. The, the deal is not sealed yet because this is too, you know, too much. So, so we, we do have the answer. We do have, we, we, we know the urgency. We have, we have alternative models. We have alternative answers. But somehow, it doesn't come across here. We're not winning yet. And, and I mean, this is maybe because, because it's more difficult because at the same time, we need to be kind of more credible, and, and I don't know who, who, who underlined, I think it was very true, that if the rich don't agree with what we want, then probably it's not going to work, and in a way it's true, so in a way we need to talk to everyone and try to convince kind of being credible, but on the other hand, what we propose is to so, oh, so something different, that, that yeah, that, that's not happening, but I mean, uh, if, Thanks, if I wasn't optimistic, so, I would be there, but still. Briefly, Molly, can yeah. you... Bring I, our spirits up at all. Of course, I can always do that. Now, I want to come back to Laurie's point, mainly because his question made me think that I hadn't got my main point across, so I'm going to try again. So, I'm not arguing that we have to find... I, I, I don't think we can get beyond having identities as human beings, but what I am arguing is that, historically, we established those identities through social relationships. But in the last capitalist crisis, an industry was invented that encouraged us to establish those identities through material consumption, and that was the advertising industry. And that's what we need to change. So we go back to an era where what we do is, is get on with each other, enjoy each other's company. Perhaps we'd have a little bit less focus on measurement if we were enjoying our lives more, I'd like to say, <coughs> in passing. Um, but, you know, that's the point. Yeah, we need identity. We find our identities in each other rather than in material stuff. But when, if we did that, then that, that would fail to stimulate the economy successfully. So it's about... What's wrong with the structure of the capitalist <coughs> economy that it has to have that kind of stimulation and that at, at the political economy level and that extraction of surplus value and accumulation and so on? So, you know, those are hard questions. The soft end of it is consumption through identity. And I just wanted to come to, is it David's yes. point? Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, I, I see some hope in that in a way because, you know, um, what we've been doing is burning up loads of stuff in order to uh, convince ourselves that we're achieving more and having progress and going faster and all of that stuff. But I tend to agree with you that those systems are going to break down more and more because of extreme weather events and other climate-related things. So our, our focus is going to shift from that. And I think that could be quite a salutary lesson for us. It's going to force us to recognise our own limits. It's also going to force us to recognise that resilience is, is a lot more important, actually, than progress. And perhaps most importantly, it's going to force us to recognise that what we really care about is being part of safe and secure communities rather than having a hell of a lot of stuff. So... I mean, there we are. That was something optimistic. Very I good. did it. Very good. Fantastic. All right, one final quick round of questions please, or comments. Please keep them quick. Uh, yep. Yeah. Danny Lanes, I work uh, in Jean Anders' office. I've uh, just got a question on uh, to do with the, the public sector, really. I mean, Tim, you, you, you made a few references to uh, the kind of sectors of the economy that are labour intensive, more socially valuable. Uh, and already you made some references to uh, working with, with, with different partners socially and, and everyone working together because 
uh, the challenge is, is so great. Uh, just really wanted to ask about, uh, I suppose, about, about a combination of how, how the public sector plays a role in this and how we can guarantee uh, that the public sector is eroded. And the reason for my question <coughs> is uh, if the economy were to shrink, uh, then obviously, uh, and have been, then obviously that puts extra pressure on the public sector and on those on, on those positive jobs, if you like, and positive roles. And actually, uh, I would argue that part of the solution has to be bolstering that part of the economy, building that. And are there innovative ways we could we could do that economically? And, and for example, how does the tax take change? And are there other pots of money and resources to actually invest in the public sector? And a question back here, yeah. Yeah, I've got to mention the Citizens Inc. because the thing is, my inspiration, uh, the, you know, uh, in joining this sort of movement was actually Richard Wilkinson, 20 years ago, who described how primitive tribes were able to, who did have, who weren't uh, egalitarian, they did have status hierarchies and, and things that they could decide were luxury goods. And they were ecologically sound because they had a strategy of sharing basic needs as a right, and you could have whatever rules you like and everything else. So I thought, uh, when I sort of helped to found the Green Party, as people out there didn't know, I thought, well, how can we apply this to a, you know, to a complex society? And that was when I came up with the idea that we now call the Citizens Income. Now, I have copies of my book here, I have started a blog, I'll leave it at that, and just listen to what you guys are going to say. About Very good. It. It's you. absolutely central, not just a good idea. Yep. Yes, um, I, I wanted to refer, my own term, my top, I joined the Greens earlier this year and just canvassed uh, the last election. But I read in the FT that yesterday an article by just Jeffrey Sachs where he talks about we must look beyond Keynes to fix our problems. And I went to his website, and um, I found that the UN had published a paper on sustainability in August, which called for a network around the world of research centres which would try out stuff. And I just wondered if I could ask the panel, is the UN relevant? Or, or, is, it, or is Greenhouse more relevant in the Green Economy yeah. European Foundation? Uh, Natalie, briefly. Uh, yes, very briefly. I two areas of questions I wanted to throw out. One, Molly, arising from what you said about advertising. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is we have to tackle advertising and the pervasiveness and the extreme, you know, the fact that it's just in your face all the time and on the tube increasing there's more video on that. And yet there's a couple of sort of classic examples we've all been citing for the last decade or more. So I'd be interested both in the panel but also anyone here doing any work on how we can find political ways to restrict advertising. Um, so just restrict people's exposure so it's that it, they have more chance to have social interaction instead of having an advert in their face. The other thing was a very general question about industrial policy. I spent a lot of time talking about how we need to bring manufacturing back to Britain, shorten our supply chains and all of that. Yeah. I'm looking very much for concrete ideas for that. For anyone from the panel or anyone in the audience who'd like to talk to me later, I'm very keen for any examples of that. Uh, thank you. And over here, yep. I was um, reading George Monbiot's article in The Guardian recently about um, consumer, uh, consuming consumption at Christmas, and several members of the panel have talked about consumer behaviour, and I wondered if any members of the panel had any ideas for suitable Christmas presents which would stimulate appropriate <laughs> Great, that's the sort of question time uh, question. Our books, the last, our books. The last, the last question. They always have that as the last question, so that's perfect. So I'm going to ask each of the panellists to include an answer to that question in their response, okay? Now, I'm afraid you have very little time to do this, panellists. You, so you've got to select one or two things to respond to in your final response. You've got about 90 seconds each, and then... Jean will uh, have a few minutes to respond to the debate uh, as a whole. So we'll just whip along the panel in this direction from left to right. So Aurelie, if you go first, pick well, one or two things. I'm, the clock is ticking. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, sorry, on the Christmas presents, since I bought some a couple of weeks ago, I, I don't have a good answer, I'm afraid. Uh, no, that's, just... that's not acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but uh, that was really hard. You can come back to that one. Yeah. Uh, no, just uh, someone said something on the UN. Yeah. Um, I wish it was more important and more relevant. I mean, ultimately, we, we need international government for so many things. 
but again, coming from my European a bit pessimistic <laughs> vision, already organizing something at European level is really hard. Uh, and I believe UN kind of governance level is what we should have and what we will hopefully have in 100 years. But, I mean, yeah, ultimately that, that, that's what it's all about. Um, and I just wanted to finish, because I can't answer to everything, um, on, 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 again on the question of equality. And, um, uh, yeah, citizens' income is probably also one of the, a part of the solution, but uh, I'm afraid ir irrealistic one right now. And they should, I think they are moved towards their, uh, by, by applying some kind of basic income in some areas, maybe in the areas of pensions, uh, by reducing working time, all those steps could lead eventually to, to citizen, citizen income, but it's not, not, we're not there yet. Um, but I, I guess, yeah, I guess in all that, what is really important for us now is really to deliver a message of hope. I mean, I've said a bit of pessimistic <laughs> stuff, and, and it's because it's the reality, but so that, that's the point. We need to give hope, but also have a bit of courage to, to say that those rich are too rich, for example, or to say that you, you, you can't afford having three cars. And, and in, in a way, I, I feel many Greens still staying so, too much in their comfort, comfort zone of environment and, and not going enough into economic and social dimension where we can have, um, yeah. And five power. seconds for your Christmas present. Cooking something nice. Yeah, yeah, there yeah, we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Local and organic and yeah. yeah. Excellent. <laughs> That'll do the trick. Tim. Very good. Very good. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, lots of interesting points. I, I think I'll just, I, I think I will just respond to the points about the public sector because I think that is that is uh, quite important. I mean, I think that, that there are there are, for example. Um, social dividends from public sector work, which are typically not recognised in the a very neoliberal um, market-oriented strategy for growth, and I think it's worth pointing that out. And, and, and generally speaking, the bolstering of, of a social economy, which isn't necessarily just the public sector, as in public administration and government, but it is in but it is in, in education, in, in health, in social care, in um, social enterprise <laughs> at the community level. Um, lots of ways in which that can, can be bolstered. Some of them actually already existing in embryonic forms. So some very nice community-led financing initiatives, some social bonds, for example, community bonds as an idea for funding that kind of activity at that kind of level in, in more sustainable ways. And I think it is, it's very important to, be, to, to put those constructive suggestions forward. I wanted to, I wanted to come back to the, this, is, is identity a, um, a bridge too far? And it obviously is in a, in a very Western, very capitalist society. But it is also, it is, it's absolutely true, as Molly has suggested, that this, this idea, at the same time as the idea that identity can be satisfied through material goods, there has also been an increased focus on identity and actually on personal identity. And I think it erodes social identities and it erodes social connections. And so the idea actually of of a strategy that looks at changing the social logic around the importance of identity and, 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 then, and rewards social identities <laughs> and social, social interventions and, and is, is, a very, is a very powerful one. And, um, and, and when it comes to Christmas, I suppose it's, it's sort of inspired my Christmas list, which is when I was recovering from my operation, I read a book which um, actually I have to say is not for the squeamish because it's about... Um, uh, various bits of the male anatomy that usually remain hidden and it and it is it's about it's written by a guy called Tim Parks um, who is um, working in for some reason in Italy and it describes his recovery from prostate problems and and it's remarkable because it starts out with 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 medicine it goes through his own exploration of his own disease it gets to the point of him understanding that his disease has multiple causes and then attempting to address these causes through um, actually just sitting still. And it turns out, and Angela and I have scientifically proven this, that sitting still and sleeping are the lowest carbon activities in the whole world. <laughs> so I recommend that you buy someone a subscription to a library so they can take out this book, and it's called uh, Teach Me to Sit Still by Tim Parks. <laughs> Very good, thank you.
So, Molly. on advertising, um, that's just a question of political will. You know, the Swedish government has a whole range of policies to control advertising. And I would suggest we, we seek to um, bring advertising to its role as, as envisaged by economic theory, which is communicating honestly simple information about homogeneous goods to consumers and I when I think about that I think about Mr Chumley Warner if you remember him in some black and white film and he he comes to the front of and he he says Mr McVitie is now selling his biscuits with chocolate on top and that's that's it that's the extent of advertising so nothing manipulative nothing emotional we just need to we just need to put that in law you know um, simple. Just become the government and we'll do that. Um, on, of course, on the Christmas present, you'd expect me to have something to say about that. Now, I have done most of my shopping, but yesterday I did go to Marks & Spencer, so nobody's allowed to look in my carrier bag. But um, the majority of my shopping I did do in Stroud. We, the Stroud pan's not as effective as once it was, but when we had the Stroud pan, I managed to get three things with all my every time I spent money, because I could use the Stroud Pound, so I could get that circulating. I could also put money into my local economy, and I could support local craft people. So, you know, I just go to my farmer's market and buy stuff. It's actually a real pleasure. And I usually know the people, so I've got that social relationship building up as well. That was a question-time answer, wasn't it? Yeah, that was very good. <laughs> <coughs> yes, uh, advertising, um, that's something we're also thinking about. And uh, there are relatively strict laws in Germany regarding children. Uh, the point is that most children nowadays uh, look, I mean, very late, um, so that doesn't apply to them anymore. And we have to, uh, and for, for example, around schools, I mean, we can also, or we're demanding uh, restrictions in advertising. I'm very happy about the question with the citizens' income because I'm convinced that we need some kind of basic income, um, not least because it's only people who are not fearful <coughs> that can be creative. Mm and can be daring and can have the courage yeah, to actually um, uh, uh, help in the transformation of our society. And um, that's why this is part of, part of my program. And regarding um, uh, Christmas presents, I must admit that I'm very old-fashioned and uh, probably don't have much fantasy because I, I only give books. <laughs> Um, because that's what I know, that's where I know what people might like, and uh, all the technological stuff I, I just can't imagine, that's beyond me. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not really intelligence, <laughs> but it's merely, um, yeah, that's <coughs> what I know best. And uh, regarding courage, that was the word that Aurelie used, um, I think what we need, and that means both, that means people, and it means politics and politicians, and it means academics. Um, is more courage. And we've lost much of that, I think, and uh, if people are actually willing to vote for politicians that tell the truth, uh, we'd be a, a, a great step forward. And that's, what I, that's my wish for the new year. <laughs> Well, thanks to all our panellists. I guess panels are a classic example of where labour productivity can't be leveraged just by speed up. Tim, would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll throw in my Christmas present. I must admit, I think it's, it should be a cause for social shame to go Christmas shopping at all, except possibly with local currency. And what I try to do is, uh, is write uh, poems for people uh, at Christmas time. Um, over now, with uh, five minutes, Jean, that's what we're giving you. That's all you've got. Five minutes for Jean to give her response to the debate. I'm confident it will be a response. It says here, final, final panel comment and summary from Jean Lambert. But knowing Jean as I do, I'm sure we're going to get something much more interesting than a summary. Jean is uh, on the Greenhouse Advisory Board. We're delighted to have her here today. Jean. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, one of the things about uh, Christmas presents, I think, is you also have to take into account the needs of the individual to whom you are giving something. So it isn't just about what makes you feel good, it's also about what makes them feel good. And there's a brilliant story, which of course I now can't remember who wrote it, by um, an American sort of uh, writer describing, you know, the child at Christmas who is given sort of useful presents by his parents, like toothbrush and this sort of thing, and the sense of gradual <coughs> and diminishing joy over the period of the day. So I think it is, you know, there is something about what does the recipient want? as well, which also really has to come into it. And then I'm not telling you what I've bought for people. So it's not a surprise anymore. Um, I, obviously, a number of the things that we've been hearing today are 
sort of there have been some key themes running through it. I'm not going to try and do all of them. But the indicators one is one of them. I'm slightly more optimistic about what's happening at the EU level than Arvind Lee is, partly because I've been having chats with somebody in the Commission about what we can do to really sort of get this moving again, because there was a lot of very valuable work done there, which started around about 1989, 1990. Again, some people of a certain age in this room might remember one of the things that happened in the UK at that time, which was the Green Party getting 15% of the vote and no bottoms on seats. Um, that happened when UKIP got presented <coughs> later. But this whole thing about indicators began to kick off after that. And I think it is at the European level. And I think that that's one of the things about events outside actually pushing, you know, what's happening with, within the institutions. Also, I mentioned the delegation that I chair earlier. One of the countries which is covered by the delegation for South Africa, South Africa, South Asia, um, get your geography right now, is, is Bhutan. And which, of course, is famous, you know, amongst <coughs> other things, um, for the Gross ha National Happiness Index. And it has to be said that the commission, which deals with the administration of that set of 72 very robust indicators, qualitative and quantitative, is the most powerful body after the monarch in that country. Nothing really happens unless that commission okays it. And one of the things that they put through that was, should Bhutan join... WTO. The feeling before they put it through the commission was yes, they should. Once they had put it through that commission and measured it against all sorts of things, the decision was no, they shouldn't. Because actually, in terms of the overall benefit of the country and the direction in which they wished to take it, joining the WTO was counterproductive. We haven't yet really got an answer about quite how that works with a more open border with India. But, you know, that's also one of the things to remember about Bhutan is they don't talk very much about the that's the bad news about them. But that set of indicators is, you know, is, is really interesting that the UN is taking it up and has asked them to do some more work in actually explaining to people how that works. So I think this is also part of the thing that not all the answers or not even all of the possibilities come from what we think of as the developed world and the industrialised world. And I think this is one of the things as well happening in the issue about climate change is how we cooperate and how we actually see ourselves linked to people in other countries with different experiences for whom maybe the situation is more immediate and who have things that they actually want to tell us, lessons that they have learned which they think we would find useful. We've also talked a lot today of in terms of sort of employment and that, that sort of um, move forward. Again, there's a lot of work happening at the international level. Somebody asked about the value of the UN. One of the valuable things about the UN is the International Labour Organization. Mm -hmm. And the work that they have been doing with um, UNEP, the, European, uh, the International Trade Union bodies, on concepts of just transition. But how do we move to a more low carbon economy? Where is the work coming from? And they are also pushing at the moment for a job rich recovery, not a growth rich recovery, but a job rich recovery, which is actually looking at where do we find the work that needs to be done um, in a way that actually sort of helps bring our societies together more. And certainly a lot of what's happening there is looking at care as an area. And one of the <coughs> things that has changed is household makeup and, and women's expectations. So therefore a lot of the things that might have happened in the past in more informal patterns, you know, a need a needing to shift. So there are some of the things out there which are happening at the moment. We've also talked about a lot a lot up to this afternoon, which I think has been really interesting, is about the, the sort of the cultural side and identity. And I think we're back to this concept of multiple identities. And I don't mean that you know, I mean that in a way in which which people feel comfortable. I think one of the things that is happening at the moment in terms of pushing us to feel a particular identity is very much about sort of the personal and who we are, as opposed to where we sit in relation to other people in our communities, other people in our societies. You know, are we part of hard-working families, or are we part of those skivers who hide behind our blinds or curtains, the window covering of your choice, and don't get up in the morning because other people are paying for us, which of course is part of what people have always worried about, the citizen's income. So, you know, this feeling about how we are being divided at the moment 
I think is part again of the fight back that we need to be making. That we are in this together in some senses and that means we need to be acting together and feeling responsibility for people who may be worse off than ourselves in this situation and not allowing them to really <coughs> push them further um, back. And you know, when you look at the moment we have the recurrence of the diseases like rickets for God's sake in the UK, you know, what are we doing with these poverty diseases in a nation which is supposed to be so rich? So that sense of identity, of feeling comfortable with multiple identities, yes, we are ourselves, but, you know, we are also part of something wider. I think it's something really important we need to be fighting for at the moment. The, one of the other areas that people were speaking about was very much this sense of, burning sense of justice and the sense of what is sacred. And I think here's something where one of the things that, that's sort of been quite important to the Green Movement, we don't necessarily like to talk about it much, but it is this sense of feeling connected to nature. It is this sense of feeling that you do have a relationship with the earth. Whether that means you want to hug trees or sit on a beach at dawn or just enjoy the peace of a park, in a sense, it doesn't matter. But it is this sense of, and I think there's a growing understanding, that well-being also comes from that sense of connection with the work, natural world around you. And I think, too, we've also, sometimes we, we sort of say to ourselves, oh, here we go, talking about children again and our grandchildren. And <coughs> but that this intergenerational dimension, this sense of there is something beyond us that we do want to pass on this world. Maybe also fits with this sense in a way of, of part of the, the stuff argument. And what is it that we are leaving? What is it that we are passing on? And what sort of quality are we move, leaving to future generations? And that intergenerational dimension, I think, again, at the moment, it's always been important to us, but at the moment, it's crucial. Because there is this feeling that, you know, again, young people are almost being used in terms of trying to develop an argument between you know, what they don't have, what the older generation has, which becomes an argument for cutting everybody's pensions and sort of giving younger people a lower wage because there will be an expectation. Again, we need to bring those generations back together. And I think this is part of that sense of the future. And it's a much more attractive one. I have this vision sometimes of future generations, you know, coming across sort of grassy covered mounds that are sort of slightly taboo areas you know, where there is this sense of it's dangerous, we don't go there. <coughs> and that actually what they will be looking at is decommissioned power stations, which have been covered over and become the sort of these sort of sacred burial mounds into the future. <coughs> and I'd rather we weren't leaving that. I'd rather we were leaving something which has a sense of space, a sense of where people can breathe and where people can feel at one with nature and with each other. And how we get there. We've heard some great ideas this afternoon. I think, you know, those of us involved in manifestos have now got some very, very useful stuff to take away. <laughs> and also, I think, some very, very powerful ideas to pass on. So thank you very much indeed to our panel and the people who've been providing the questions and information. Thank you.